I'm Godard Brundrup. I'm in Tucson, Arizona at the Science of Consciousness Conference 2022. And I'm here with Dr. Harald Atmansbacher, who has presented his view of a dual aspect theory of mind and body, uh, unus mundus, one world theory, as he said, uh, in which there is an underlying unity which is no neutral uh, between the mental and the physical and gives rise to those. Can you explain this theory briefly? If you want to put it really succinctly, then I think this is exactly it. Of course, one can say a lot of more things about that, but I think, yes, we have one psychophysically neutral domain within reality, and what many people think are the main parts of reality, phys the physical world and the mental world, are just sort of speak offsprings of the psychophysically neutral. And they can, can act back on it also. This idea of neutral monism, at least to me as a panpsychist, um, raises the problem whether this is not ultimately a panpsychism again because the underlying neutral stuff, whatever it is, has to be able to give rise to the mental. And nothing can give which it does not possess. So some form of proto-mentality has to be present, uh, which is called the, the genetic, proto, genetic problem by panpsychist. So some form of proto-mentality has to be present down at the level of the neutral. I understand what you're saying. So first of all, let me say the big bonus that you have uh, with a metaphysical framework that gives rise to the mental and the physical by a kind of decomposition is that you have, that you can explain why we have psychophysical correlations all over. Because they are just remnants of the, of the lost unity of the psychophysically dom uh, neutral domain as a whole, right? Now your other question, the genetic problem as you call it, um, in some sense this is right what you say, but um, of course the mental and the physical are not, um, in the, are not pre-existing already, but they are, the, 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 the psychophysical, neut psychophysically neutral domain has the potential to decompose into those. So in some sense, we have to assume a structure in the psychophysically neutral that, um, uh, that has certain stable subdomains into which it can decompose or decomposes best. And therefore, uh, I say yes and no, there is some kind of potential in, in the psychophysically neutral to decompose into these two domains. But of course, this does not mean that the two domains are already pre-existing. If I understand you correctly, the psychophysical relations are not causal relations. Uh, so they are not relations of efficient causation, but you said they are meaning relations. Uh, so meaning is built, in, built into the very fabric of reality. That's a surprising claim. What, what do you mean by a meaning relation that is built into the very fabric of reality. This is, um, this is one of the uh, crucial points of this approach. The point is that, you know, when you talk about relations between two so different domains as the physical and the mental, nobody would still, would, would have a, I mean, there's simply no chance to, to form causal relations between them. Causal relations in the sense of efficient causation. I mean, Aristotle has other notions of causation, we're not talking about those. Um, so causal relations in the sense of efficient causation are inconceivable and it was the great idea that you know all these pioneers which we are talking about in this dual aspect uh, version of the mind-matter problem from Pauli over Jung uh, to Eddington, Wheeler, David Bohm and Basil Hailey they all thought that um, it's a radical idea that the that the best way they can think of how the correlations between the physical and the mental can be substantiated is something that has nothing to do with physics anymore, with established science, must be something completely different. 
And they came up with the idea it could be meaning. Meaning is, a, uh, is an intrinsically relational um, concept. You, when you talk about meaning, you always have to have two poles which are connected by the meaning, something that is the meaning and something that is meant. And therefore, they tried to work that out in different ways. You used um, several of the founding fathers of quantum mechanics now, and it seems that the whole model is based on a key element of quantum mechanics, the distinction between entanglement and decomposition. So that the underlying uh, neutral stuff would be the entanglement, which would be decomposed or that would into the mental on the one hand and the physical on the other hand. Uh, is it legitimate to use quantum mechanics, an area which we have difficulty understanding, to explain uh, or we try to resolve the mind-body problem? Um, so the transfer of that metaphor, that quantum mechanics metaphor, is it really helpful for understanding the mind-body problem? The point is not to explain the mind-body problem with quantum mechanics. This is not the point. We are trying to, I mean, we, uh, all these people who I mentioned before have been trying because they come, they all come out of the tradition of quantum physics. And they saw that already in quantum physics, we have a kind of a correlation, these non-local correlations that you just referred to, which are, not, which are not causal and they are not by chance, right? So, and therefore, um, the idea was we might be able to use quantum physics or quantum theory as a metaphor, not as, a, not, not as an explanation, as a metaphor to, which can be um, moved over to the mind-body problem. And of course, when you do that, then in the mind-body problem is something much bigger than quantum mechanics. Quantum mechanics is just, is just physics. But we want a model that relates the physical to the mental. So it cannot be a physical theory. It's impossible, but it, we can, we can, we might find a kind of metaphor or a structural analogy, which we can move over and then try to discuss what the consequences would be for the mind-matter problem, and that's what we've been doing. But it doesn't stop at this dualistic or this dichotomy of the mental and the physical, mm -hmm. because your th system basically is a system of three elements that stand in relation to each other. And so we get three different ontological realms. Is this related somehow to the idea of three worlds as we find, for example, in Popper or with Roger Penrose that in addition to the mental and the physical, we have a third realm, which is the realm of the abstract, the mathematical, or in the tradition of Frege, that there is this third realm, uh, which is not psychological, which was very important to Frege, but is objectively mathematical and neutral, uh, uh, and neutral in respect to the mental and the physical. Uh, is your system inspired by this tradi uh, tradition? Why do we think it is a good idea to put the third, the psychophysically neutral? And that's what I already indicated uh, before, because you know, the psychophysically neutral, if you, if you put that into the picture, then by de decomposition of the psychophysically neutral, you, can, you, do, you do not only get the physical and the mental, but you always, generically, get correlations between the two. There is no other metaphysical framework for the mind-body problem that explains the psychophysical correlations. You must be aware of that, right? And they were just po posited ad hoc, or you know, or they, or they, they are simply um, uh, neglected, or whatever. We have we have really a model that explains them in a very simple and in a very, in a very deflationary way. Now it's it's correct that we that this uh, uh, leads us into a tripartite problem, and um, I agree with you that uh, the picture that that Roger Penrose paints with the mental, the physical, and for him it's. He doesn't talk about the psychophysically neutral, he talks about the platonic reality. But of course the platonic reality is psychophysically neutral. So it would be, uh, it would be one example 
for a psychophysically neutral domain, which is not less real than the physical and the mental. Every mathematical Platonist thinks that way, everyone. Alain Kohn, Carl Friedrich Gauss, who you want. I mean, maybe the more mediocre mathematicians don't, but really the, the, the great mathematicians are all more or less Platonists. And I agree also that uh, Frege's abstract forms, or abstract forms also, Hegel talks about, for instance, the logical principle, and Jung, you mentioned that before, talks about the unus mundus. They all have structural similarities. They're all, they're all fleshed out in different ways, depending on the, the, the scientific and academic scholarly background of the person who talks, right? But exactly as you say, Penrose and Frege are two key examples, I think. Your theory in, reminds me of Spinoza. And would you say that ultimately what you suggest here is a modern form of Spinozism. Is your system a scientifically informed 21st century form of the ideas that were developed by Spinoza? Uh, I would hope so. I mean, if you really ask me uh, to say yes or no, then, I, then this would be a clear yes. <laughs> it would be a clear yes. Of course, Spinoza didn't have all the tools that we have now, no, the mathematics and the physics and so on. So he couldn't have come up with this idea of uh, decomposition a la quantum mechanics and so on. But I think it's a way to make Spinoza's ideas, or at least some of them, more, much more concrete than he could ever have done.